the reason for me that um, I guess Francis will always hold this special place in my life because of his influence is because how he has influenced my children, my college-age children who just love to hear what he has to say. And I think every once in a while, in a generation, there's a unique voice that God kind of brings in to challenge all of us in the way we think, to think in an entirely different way. Francis Chan is one of those voices. So would you give him a hand? <laughs> Good to see you, buddy. Thanks, Phil. Now, I, I just need you to know that whenever you've spoken at any of our conferences, we've never given you a time limit. <laughs> But according to whoever's in charge here, and I'm not going to tell you who that is, okay. they said I can ask you five questions, and you have one minute to answer each question. Perfect. Now, later he's going to come back and have a little more time, but I, I don't know how this works except just start right into this, and um, we'll see if we can get all these in. And the okay. first question I want to ask you is actually a question that I've been asked. I know in 1994 you started Cornerstone. It's been an unbelievable journey for you. That chapter of your life has just closed, and you're starting a brand new chapter. So people ask me, what's next for Francis Chan? I have no idea, honestly. <laughs> you know, there's times when you leave because God's calling you to something and you know what it is. And uh, um, this is one of those times where I don't know. I don't know what's next. And uh, I, what I do know is in October, my, my family and I, we're going to go overseas to like a third world country and um, just serve somewhere. I'd, I'd love to just be obscure for a couple months and just do something and spend some time in prayer, get away from... And not get away from America. Yeah, get away from America. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, I just think more clearly when I'm out of this environment and go, okay, biblically, what do I know? Now let me go back into that country as a missionary. That's great. And, and, and so that's, that's all I know at this point. Now I wonder if we can collect time. I mean, if oh, you I have 15 got, seconds I got left, 10 you only minutes. Wait, 15 sh- seconds on the next and question. Then yeah, go ahead. I'm going to come home on an airplane. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> cool. Okay, okay. here's another question. You talked about, you know, a little bit about your family going with you, and, and I've had the privilege of meeting Lisa. I know she's here somewhere. What, what does family look like for you? People always wonder about that. I've met your kids, great family, so talk to us about your family life. My family is great. My wife is here. Uh, she's over there. There she is. Um, so what does my family look like? They look like her. They're very beautiful. <laughs> um, my wife was uh, the former Miss Teen California. Um, just a beautiful woman. Hi, honey. <laughs> uh, let me see. What else? Um, my kids are great. Got a 14-year-old A daughter girl. who sings yes. incredibly. Sings. Uh, very, very uh, emotional. Um, <laughs> 10-year-old girl was also great. Five-year-old girl. <laughs> back up. Back up a second. You kind of flew by that one. Emotional. How old is she? No, she's 14. Oh, she's okay, a, I got you. Know, you. Okay, yeah, yeah. It's almost 15, so she's okay. in that stage. Yeah, very great. cool, though. Oh, yeah, We're it's very true. in love with each other. Greatest girl in the world. A 10 year old girl, five year old girl, four year old boy, Zeke, who uh, he, he's, he's manning up a little bit. Just been hanging out with him a little bit more because he's got three sisters, so he's been a sissy <laughs> till lately. Okay. Okay, ready? Okay, here's, a, here's another one. I actually had a friend who texted me a while ago and he said, be sure to ask, ask Francis ask this question. In the world of relationships, there are huggers and not huggers, and you are not a hugger. Why are you not a hugger? You know, I, I, I'm getting to be more of a hugger by far. Because a lot of people I, want to hug you tonight after this is I, over. Yeah, I just want exactly. to know how that looks like. Well, it's just, it's, I don't know if it was growing up. I mean, we were just not affectionate as a family at all growing up. My, my family now, are, we're very affectionate. I mean, it was a great afternoon. Um, but, but it's just, um, <laughs> but... Uh, so I know, I know my immediate family, like, oh, yeah, yeah, huggy, huggy, you know, my kids and everything. But, but growing up, it wasn't that way. And so, um, you know, my wife's family is very uh, affectionate with each other. <laughs> I can't believe I said that. No yeah, one's even thinking okay. about it. Yeah. It's okay. It's, uh, it's being um, webcast to millions of people, wow. but that's not I'm a problem. Tr- yeah. If I were white, you'd see I'm turning red. Okay. But... Um, <laughs> We, we, we're, uh, we're very affectionate now. Um, I'm just not affectionate. I just don't like people coming up and hugging me. It's like, uh, okay, you know, just, I, I understand we're supposed to be loving, but uh, I'm getting better, getting much better. <laughs> I mean, I love you. I just don't want to touch you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's another question. 
Crazy Love has been a great book, Forgotten God, unbelievable books. I, I, every time I come across different people who are reading those yeah. books, I, you know, we, we talk about it, we end up in some great conversations. But you're getting ready to shift to a whole different concept of film. You're moving into a different world. You've decided that instead of the book, you're going to do this thing with flannel, mm-hmm. and flannel has just done. I've seen some of the footage. Yeah. It's amazing. Why the shift from the book to the film? Yeah, I don't know that it's necessarily a shift. Like, now I'm a film guy. Um, just, just like I was never really an author guy. It, it, you know, that, that was just this random thing at this moment where I just felt like the Lord really wanted me to write. Not being a writer, it was very awkward. And so, you know, I did that. And then now it, this opportunity presented itself. And I said, you know, I, I, it's just right. So let me try this now and let me do this. I mean, who knows if I'll start dancing next. You know, it's just, it's, it's not like I'm... I'm necessarily shifting. I just believe it's, it's the opportunities the Holy Spirit puts on me at that moment. And so I believe this is something that's of God. And I tell you, we've seen some of, this, some of the films already. And I know that there are actually in this series, there are seven different films. Mm-hmm. Is there a reason why there's seven? Um, it's just as, as uh, the flannel guys asked me, what are you interested in? What do you want to speak about? I just started naming these things and as we just came up with all these different topics it really got narrowed down to four very clear things uh, the first three things being the father son and the holy spirit and then the second thing was my passion for the church and what the church ought to be committed to and so we use acts 242 as an outline of how they devoted themselves to fellowship communion prayer and um Teaching. Did I, did I miss teaching? Yeah, okay, yeah, I knew there was one more teaching. Um, and so we said, oh, you know, why don't we do a series of three with the Holy Spirit, Father, Son, Holy, Holy Spirit, and then do a series of four with the church. I, I have enjoyed over the last few years hearing you speak on these issues, and I know that um, in just a minute you're going to let them see the film mm-hmm. or one of the mm-hmm. films. So would you take a few minutes now, no timeline, no, they just tell me explain. one minute. One minute? <laughs> yes, yes, one Again, minute. Well, they said, you hand it over explain, to me, you walk explain. off. Explain, I'll walk, walk off. off. Yeah, I'll walk off, you explain. <laughs> and, uh, I have one minute. You explain, okay. I'm off, I'm um, So this first film, what you're going to see right now, first thing the flannel guys said, okay, if you could speak about anything, what would it be? Just give me one thing. And, and I said, you know, it's not even about what I would speak about. As I pray, and if I were to say, God, What is the one message you want to give America? I believe with everything I know of this book, I believe God would say, those people do not take me seriously. They do not fear me like people have in the past. And I said, I believe that's the message God wants to speak. And so that's what I want to speak about. It's not, oh, here's Francis' hobby horse. It's best I know of scripture. I think this is what God would say. He would say, these people need to fear me again. And so that's the first uh, film we're going to release. It's called Fear God. That's, that's all it is, is, is we're not coming in with a fancy title, and we're not trying to trick people into watching something about fear and God. We're just telling people, you know what? You need to fear him. I don't care who you are. We've gotten way too arrogant in talking about him, the Holy One, and we need to get back to fear. And so hopefully this film gets people thinking that way again. So that's what you're going to see. Can we just, uh, I, I hadn't seen that in a while, and uh, just that some of those truths in Scripture are just, I'm praying as that was going on, and just going, Lord, I, I want to fear you like I should, and so can we just kind of forget this is a premiere, and forget that we're at a conference, and just, can we just take a moment and just see ourselves as a bunch of little human beings in a room? with this almighty God up there. I don't want this to be about a project or whatever else. This is about reality. Like, it is completely up to him right now whether or not another word comes out of my mouth and whether or not I take another breath. And that's true of you as well. And, and I think sometimes we forget that, especially those of us who are in ministry. And we say that word God so flippantly and so often that we get casual, but to recognize right now in heaven there's a being who's sitting on a throne right now whom the Bible says he dwells in unapproachable light. 
and there's this whole world going on up there that we can't see. And we're just a bunch of these, these mortal beings here on this, in this room. And to not take, for me, not to take myself too seriously and think, wow, look at this. Look at, it's just, man, I'm one breath away from seeing him, and so are you. And we've all had friends younger than we are who have already seen him. And that was a shocking moment. And let's just acknowledge that right now. In fact, um, can I just pray right now? Can we just speak to him and ask him to, to speak to us and direct us and, and uh, just use the words of, of, of this book to, to, to change us? So would you pray with me? God, we just think of you in heaven right now. And we just put aside what anyone else thinks right now. God, we just think about you in heaven. Lord, you know the truth about us. And there are so many lies in this room. And you see through all of it. And you see us and you know us. And you know when we've been too casual. And just we, we just say your name like you're another person. Rather than almighty God. And so, Father, right now, just as leaders and as, as Christian workers, Father, I just pray that you would just first work in our hearts and forget about anything else. God, it is an honor to speak to you. I believe you hear me from heaven right now, and you see what's going on in every single person's hearts, even my own right now on this stage. Lord, you know if I'm fake or if I'm real. You just know it all. Help us to be people who see you and love you so much more than anything else on this earth with all of our hearts, all of our souls, all of our minds. God, not just use these Christian cliche things, God, but just from the depths of our souls to really love you and fear you. Not fear people and what they think of us and what they can do for us or to us, but to only think of you, God. Just for the next 20 minutes, Lord, that we could just pull that off. Thank you, God, for your mercy, for your grace, for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. We started off, I started off wanting to talk about the fear of God because I just think so many of us that attend these things we call churches, um, we don't get them. We're not even coming close to getting what God is like. I attended church for so many years and did the church thing, and, and it wasn't until I really studied this book for myself and seriously got into it that I began to understand what God was really like, because sadly we neglect certain things in our gatherings, because we, we, we want people to believe, and this is a good thing, like we want our friends to believe in God, and so we'll say the things that we think they'll like about God, and then we'll leave other things out, but what we end up doing is we start watering down this, this picture of God to where people don't fear Him, and they don't get Him, and they're not really even worshiping the true God anymore because we've been so selective about which verses we would read. I don't think that I'm, I'm coming up and finding an obscure verb here or passage here. I'm just, I'm reading the Bible very simply. That's what we call it, basic. It's like, this isn't anything obscure. It's like if anyone would just pick up this book and start reading, you'd see we ought to have a pretty high level of respect for God. And, and it's almost like we don't even know what to do with the biblical God when we're confronted him, with Him. Uh, we live in a world where people are so arrogant about God that, that, that the thought of a God being able to speak this whole planet into existence and then six chapters later you have the right to say, you know what, I'm grieved that I made them. I'm going to kill every single one of them. That's an offensive, offensive thought. Most people say, well, God has no right to take those millions of people and then just kill them, just flood them because he's grieved that he ever made them because of their sin and just save this one family on the ark? Like, like we don't even know what to do with passages like that. This morning I was reading, um, 
uh, Genesis, and uh, there's that passage in um, Genesis 32. It's right after, I'm sorry, Exodus 32. Right after uh, Moses comes down, they made that golden calf. Remember that? And, and what do you do with a passage like this? Like I was reading this morning, verse, uh, verse 26, where uh, after all that stuff happened, it says, Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him, and he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Put your sword on your side, each of you, and go to and fro from gate to gate throughout the camp, and each of you kill his brother and his companion and his neighbor. And the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and that day about 3,000 men of the people fell. And Moses said, Today you have been ordained for the service of the Lord, each one at the cost of his son and of his brother, so that he might bestow a blessing upon you this day. That's a disgusting passage in our world. We we can't even begin to preach passages like that. Wait, wait, are you kidding me? So, so God told him to strap swords on and and, and then just, just go back and forth in the camp and just start killing people because of their sin. Kill your brother, kill your son. Just start killing 3,000 of them? See, even right now, as I talk about this, you're uncomfortable, right? It's like, what? And then God says, okay, you know what? Because you did that, you guys are going to be my priests. You guys were the godly ones. You were actually willing to put. We have no context of even understanding a God like that in in a church culture where we say, well, I I, I don't want to get baptized because it might offend my grandmother. And that's perfectly acceptable. And and so we we, we don't get things like that. Like even pastors, people in ministry, we we don't get, we we don't even know how to preach Ezekiel. When, when God, God demands, commands this, this prophet of his, he goes, you know what, I want you to lay on your side for 390 days. Lay on one side for 390 days? Okay, well, okay, you're done, you're done. After three, now, now flip over, go to the other side. It's time just 40 days. Like, well, what do you do with that? And, and, and the hardest part to me when, you know, when I'm reading Ezekiel is when he, he says, okay, now I'm going to take your wife and I'm going to kill her today. I'm going to take away the delight of your eyes because it's going to be an example. I'm going to use it as as kind of a a picture for Israel um, because I'm I'm about to take them and and remove that temple from them, uh, the delight of their eyes. And so I'm going to have your wife die today, and you're not going to mourn for her, and I'll explain why. Oh, wait, so you just told this guy to lay on his side for 390 days, you do this, and then you, you take his wife and you do this. See, we don't, we don't even begin to understand a God who has the right to do something like that, demand something that of his ministers when, when, when we live in a ministerial culture that says, well, uh, it's okay if you don't accept that job, you know, as a, as a pastor because it only pays like 50 grand. You don't get retirement and uh, you might not be able to afford a house. And we're like, yeah, yeah that's not a good position for you. Like, how in the world do we even begin understanding a God who is so holy that he just says, look, I I can just tell you to do what I want you to do, and I'm worth it. Trust me, I'm worth it. See, these these are things we have to just neglect, things that we just glance over. I mean, I I read these scriptures, and I just go, you know, I, I get scared sometimes. I get scared for, for people who call themselves Christians in our country. I mean, I, I hope I don't, uh, I hope I don't come across as guys that's just mad and judgmental. I'm a guy that's scared. I'm a guy that's, that, that, that has friends that, 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 uh, that, that say they love God, and I look at their life, and, and I love these people. And, and so when I read this book, I'm like, ah, man, your actions, your life, it doesn't match up. It doesn't seem like you take this God seriously. I'm a guy who's scared for himself sometimes, where I go, man, have I sunk into that? Have I neglected some of these truths? And, 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 and I understand the grace of God, the grace of God, but the grace of God should lead us to repentance. That's what the kindness of God is. It's not these two mutually exclusive things that, you know, either you're a grace of God guy or you're a repent guy, you know? It's, it's as you experience his kindness 
The Bible says that's what leads us toward repentance. The two go together. And so, you know, as they ask, okay, what do you, what do you want to talk about? I go, first, let's just understand who God is so that when we pray, we don't have some weird picture in our head of some old man sitting in a chair, but we understand that he's a holy God. And I, and I, so I go, and also this idea of following Jesus and what we call Christian today. I get very concerned. Jesus says there's a narrow and difficult road that few will find, and it leads to life. And then there's this broad, easy road that leads to destruction, and many are going to enter through it. They're just going to slide right in because it's easy. And and that wide road is not marked hell. It's marked heaven. But it's just as easy. You know, everyone's going down this way, and there's this narrow road that leads to life. And and, and so, so what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? You know, that was the second film. It's, it's, I, I just thought, man, I get concerned because I don't read this book and go, I, like if I were on an island, if I were on an island, I read this book through, I would not put it down and think, I need to pray a prayer and accept Jesus into my heart. I wouldn't come up with that. I mean, honestly, those of you who read this book, really, is that what you would come up with? I would realize, you know what, I need to follow this Jesus. I want to follow him. And you know what? I need this Holy Spirit you're talking about. I, that's what I would walk away from this, 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 you know, reading of. I'd go, give me this spirit. Give me this spirit because I want this power. I want this power so that I can be a follower of Jesus. I want this power so that I can have impact on other people. And, and so that's why the third film is about the Holy Spirit because I'm going, gosh, that's what I would come away with. But, but as you look around at people who call themselves Christians, are you, do, do, do unbelievers go, wow, I mean, they're radically different. It's like God is inside of them. No, you can't tell the difference so often. And I'm Oh, Lord, I want to be one of these people that is filled with your spirit. I want, I, I want all of him because that's what I see in this book. And so then when I came to the church, I said, you know, I'm just, I'm burdened for the church. I love the church. I love America. I love the people that I know in this country, in my city, in my town. I, 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 I really care about them. And, uh, and, and yet when I read in the Bible what the church was like, I mean, if you were on that island reading this book and you, and you, you heard about these believers and then you come to America and, and, you, and you go, okay, I want to visit one of these places that's filled with these people. And you walked into a church gathering, a, a, a church service. Is that what you would have expected after reading this book? I mean, what would you have expected to see when you walked in the doors of a, you know, church building? You would expect these people that were crazy about each other, that were so in love with each other, where, where there was no needs. I mean, you would look forward going, man, I want to be a part of that group because there's no needs in that group. Everyone's looking out for each other. Everyone's a servant like Jesus was, you know, and they're giving to each other and they're caring for one another. You wouldn't expect to walk into a room and have everyone sitting in these chairs, facing forward, hearing a message, and then going home. You would expect this incredible love amongst these people. And and so for me, I look at that and I go, that's what I want to be a part of. That's, That's what I believe God wants us to be a part of. When the elders and I were reading this and studying the book of Acts, because the thing is, okay, let's face it. You read about the early church. I I think very, very few people in America read the book of Acts and go, wow, that's just like my church. (laughs) Right? Who does that? Man, we love each other like that. We we go and carry you like that. We, We do all these radical things. We put our life on the line like that. We're committed like that. No, instead we go, oh, I wish I lived back then. And as elders at our church, we just said, wait, why can't we live like that now? Who says we can't just give up our possessions freely to one another? Who says we, I can't just say right here, here's my bank account. Who, who needs help, you know, to look amongst the elders and go, look, whatever, what, what's mine is yours. Because these are people that I trust as brothers. It, it was a time when we said, you know what, I, I don't, I, forget your life insurance. I got, I got your back. I, I got you covered. 
and we trusted one another. And it was like, let's start living this way and start expanding this circle and encourage the church to start living this way again. And, and, and it, it's, been a, it's been a great process. It's been difficult. You know, because it's so much easier to walk in a room and have no relationship with people. Relationships are difficult. Forgiveness is difficult. Bearing with one another is difficult. I'd rather ditch. I'd rather leave. I don't even want to touch anyone. You know, just give me my seat in the back. Let me face forward. But then I read this book. I go, that's not the way it's supposed to be. And, and, and yet we'll, we'll say things, well, but if you do that, no one's going to show up. And I go, you know what? Then no one shows up. I don't care. Because we, it's not enough to just do something. It, it really isn't. When God is specific of how he wants his bride to look, that's what we as elders, you know, agreed. We said, look, we all agree this is the way the church is supposed to look. Okay, then we have to do this. It's not, okay, well, the cost might be too great or this or that. No, we have to do this. Otherwise, what's, what's the point? This must happen. You see, in the book of Malachi, the people were bringing sacrifices, and God was disgusted with it. He goes, I'd rather you just shut the doors and not... I wish someone would shut the doors to that temple. You're giving me these half-hearted sacrifices. I, I didn't ask for that. Ever since the beginning, it's, it's, it's never been good enough to just say, well, at least I'm doing something. There's always been the acceptable offering and the unacceptable one. Cain and Abel. It's like, come on, what, what's wrong with vegetables? What's wrong with it? He worked hard. He must have toiled to produce those vegetables, the fruit. You know, he brought it to you, Lord. He gave you something. And God said, that's not what I asked for. That's not what I asked for. I asked for a blood sacrifice. And when he says to the church and, and, and to, to ministers, to pastors like me, I, I, I can say, but God, I work tirelessly. I got all these people in this room, and, and I got people to come. And then, you know, they got baptized. They did this. They did that. He goes, I... That's not what I asked for. I wanted a picture of my body where they loved one another, where they cared for each other. But if I had done that, it would have, you know, there wouldn't have been that many. I, I asked you for this. And so I'm in this period, as many of you guys know, where, man, I stepped away from the church that I pastored for 16 years. Still love that church and still working with the elders of trying to get this church to where we believe God wants it to be, but I just felt like I needed to just step out for a little while, um, and it's something I have to do. I have to pursue this picture of the church that I see in Scripture, because when I stand before God, I don't want, you see that whole passage about wood, hay, and stubble burning up versus what's, what's truly built? That's talking about pastors, it's talking to, to the pastors and the, the building of the church. Paul was talking about he was the expert builder. And so the question is, is what did you build? Just a bunch of wood, hay, and stubble people that come, they just want to hear you because you speak well? Or did you really build the church that God called you to build? Um, which is filled with people who really fear the Lord. With people who've decided to follow Jesus people who believe in his Holy Spirit, and, 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 and for us to give that picture of the world, where 1 John 4 says, uh, no one's ever seen God, but if we love one another, his, his love abides in us. You see, see that verse? It's, it's like no one's ever seen him, but if we would get together and really love each other the way we should, it's like though no one's seen him, they would get a glimpse of God. They'd, get a, they, they'd finally get to see him. You see, it, to me, it's not, I don't believe all these people are just rejecting God. Yeah, of course, many, many, many will. But I believe there are a lot of people out there that have just never seen him. They've never seen a picture of the church where they loved each other and bore with one another and cared for one another and, and shared and prayed for one another. For, just, just all of that and embodied Jesus Christ. And so what is, this, is not, this is not a DVD series to me or a film series to me. This is, uh, this is what I believe God has placed on my heart to share. Uh, I believe it's his message. I, and I don't, what's beautiful, the reason why I believe that is as he has convicted me and the elders of Cornerstone about these things, I'm meeting with people all around the nation that individually, on their own times, alone with the Lord, you know, they're coming to me and go, hey, this is what I'm learning. I'm like, shut up. 
That's exactly what I've been learning. That's exactly what God's been saying to us. Yeah, you too, you too, you too. It, it's just this thing where I believe it's a movement of God. See, I don't believe, okay, hey, let's do this and let's start a movement. No, I believe God has started a movement here in the U.S., and I'm very excited to be a part of it. I'm going, okay, I think this is a turning. This is a time of change in the U.S., in the, in the American church, and I'm very excited about that. And I believe this is another piece that I get to be a part of, you know, and I believe I get to play my part in this. I, because this younger generation, some of you guys know with your, your, your kids, it, you know, they don't really care for church the way it's been done all these years. I mean, you read all the stats, what, six, it's, you know, you had different stats, but 65 to 90 percent of the kids in your youth ministry, children's ministry, will not be attending church when they turn 18. You know, so over half of them easily. And, and I've seen figures over, over 90% to, to where you just go, okay, so what we're doing is not interesting to them. It's not, it's not working for them. Why? Because when they read this book, they go, that's not it. That doesn't match up to me. And so either do the real thing or don't do anything at all. And, and I believe God's stirring. He's stirring his people. And uh, I get very excited about it. I get emotional about it. Um, I don't even know what I'm doing next, honestly. I just know I've got to pursue this, 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 what, what I, I believe the Spirit is leading us toward and, and to interpret this book as faithfully as I can and pursue that, even if it means losing everything, even if it means being hated, because that's what it means to, to be a believer. You know, one last thought. No clue what's going on up there. But um, I think they're demons um, <laughs> trying to stop us. But, uh, but, uh, Ah, I got 56 seconds. Okay, I was in London just a little bit ago, and, uh, and they took me uh, to Oxford, Oxford, and this, this guy was giving me these, these tours, this tour of this area, and he was telling me that the history of these churches, and he showed me these squint holes that they built into the architecture. That was to keep the lepers out, and they could squint and look in because we don't want those people inside our midst. They showed me where they burned the martyrs to death. We burned our own people to death. Disgusting. They, they taught me about the slavery and how the Christians fought for slavery. We, we, we talked about the wars. I mean, all these periods of history where we, we're embarrassed now, right? We look back and go, ugh, uh, and people use it against us like, ugh, that. But at that time, those people didn't see that it was weird because it was the norm. And so while I was in England a few weeks ago, I thought, I wonder what's weird that I don't see right now. I mean, one day I believe, and, and then as I thought that way, I thought, you know what? Years from now, they'll look back at our generation here in America and go, man, that was a weird time. It was this whole consumer time where people would leave their churches because there was a better children's area there or there was this. It was just weird people. They, you know, they, they would go here because there was a better speaker there or they would leave because they didn't like this one person in the church. And it was all about consuming, consuming, consuming while there's this world that was dying. That's a legacy that we'll leave behind that we may not see the weirdness of. But when I was outside of it, I go, I don't want to be that. I want to be part of the generation that says, no, we saw that, we caught that, and we turned it around. You know, just like when they said, no, 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 we, we figured out the slavery thing. They were taking things out of context, and we turned it around. I, I just believe that's what God's doing right now, and I get very, very excited about being part of a generation that's going, you know what? Let's pursue the real thing, all or nothing. I know it's going to cost, and I know it's going to hurt, and I know I will hate it at times but I'm going to deny myself, pick, pick up my cross, and I'm going to follow him. And I'm going to join with others around the world that are going to pursue this. And so that's what this is about. It's not a, it's not a gimmick movie thing. It's like, okay, I think this is what God is doing, and I want to give my life to it. Let me pray for us. <sighs> Father, just help us in this room, God. I don't Forget about the people who are going to see this in the future. We in this room, God, make us real, true followers of you, pursuing true community, true church. God, you are so good, and we don't want any imitation. We want you and only you. So God, please help us surrender our hearts to all of our comforts, all of our, our fleshly desires. Help us to really give those things up and pursue the relationships you want us to have with one another and to actually become like Jesus Christ, Lord. Help us to become like him. 
It's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. You guys have a great evening.